Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good again. See everybody back, and uh, we're going to just continue right on with our Bible study where we left off in Hebrews chapter 6. And uh, for those of you just joining us on television who may have never caught the program before, we're just a simple, yeah, that's a good word for it, isn't it? We're just a simple Bible study. We don't have a lot of glitz. We, we're not banked with flowers because, after all, this is just a classroom. And classrooms aren't fancy, are they? You know, I, I get such a kick out of our listeners. Uh, we're one of our seminars. Now, I, I shouldn't probably do this, but... Uh, you all know me well enough. My audience knows me well enough. We were at one of our seminars, and a lady uh, was saying to something that Iris just happened to overhear, and she said, you know why I give to Les Feldick Ministries? And the other gal says, no. He says, he doesn't spend it all on clothes. <laughs> well, that's true. Uh, we don't try to come in here with a fashion plate, and uh, we just simply want to teach the Word in a way that anyone can understand and as I've said so often, we're not associated with any one group. We are totally independent, and uh, we are responsible only to the Lord himself, and he's the one that provides. But, of course, we do want to thank you for your prayers, your financial support. We couldn't do it without you. All right, enough for that. Let's go back, back into Hebrews chapter 6. We're still in verse 1, and uh, we're just going to use this for a jumping off, and we'll go right back where we left off in the last moments of our last program. Hebrews chapter 6, therefore, because of what has just been said in the last verses of chapter 5, that it was necessary to feed them milk because they weren't ready for meat. So Paul says, leaving or moving on from the principles or the words of the beginning of Christ and go on to perfection or to a maturity. In other words, like someone just said at break time, less this is just like the Bible as a whole. Yeah, it's a progressive revelation. From Genesis to the book of Revelation, it's a progressive revealing of the things of God. All right, so now then to take another look at the words of the beginning of Christ or his earthly ministry, we're going to go right back where we left off, and that was in Matthew chapter 10. <coughs> and you saw in chapter 9 in our last program that Jesus went everywhere preaching the gospel <laughs> of the kingdom. My very few people understand that that is not the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the grace of God was that which was revealed to the Apostle Paul through the revelation of the mysteries. But the gospel of the kingdom is what Jesus, and beginning with John the Baptist and the Twelve, are proclaiming to the nation of Israel. And that is the good news that the king is here. He's ready to give them the promised kingdom that was all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant. Now, in view of those promises, then, we jumped into chapter 10 in the last moments of our program, and we have the 12 disciples chosen. And now here comes their marching orders. In verse 5, <clears throat> these 12, Jesus sent forth, and he commanded them. Now listen, when the Lord of glory gave a command, that was not to be taken lightly. That was set in concrete, and he commanded them, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Now, did you hear that? Did you see that? Go not into the way of the Gentiles, into any city of the Samaritans who were half-breeds. They were more Jew than Gentile, but they were half-breeds. So into the city of the Samaritans, enter you not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now that's plain language, as plain as language can get. Do not go to the Gentiles. Go only to the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes, the lost sheep. Now let that sink in. And the next time you try to share it in your Sunday school class, they'll run you out the back door. More than likely, yeah, I got heads nodding. You've experienced it. Oh, they don't want to hear that. <clears throat> but see, this is what Paul wrote in Romans, that Jesus Christ was the minister of the circumcision, Israel, by the truth of God, 
to confirm or to bring to fulfillment the promises made to the fathers. And what were those promises made to the fathers? That Israel was to be the favored nation and that God the Son would come and be a physical king as well as a redeemer. And the nation of Israel can come to that place of blessings, living in peace and prosperity. Okay? Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now verse 7. And as you preach, say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right, let's jump over to Luke chapter 1 for just a second and get just a little glimpse of what that was to be for the nation of Israel. Chronologically, of course, we're going to back up a few years because this is when the angel had announced to uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth that they were going to have a child. And now he's just been born. Luke chapter 1, and I'm going to drop in at verse 67, honey. <coughs> And the angel has announced that this child to be born of Zechariah and Elizabeth, who also were in their older years, was going to be the herald of the king, John the Baptist. Now, when the king would come, you see, this is what Israel was looking for in fulfillment of the promises made to the fathers. I'm going to repeat it, and repeat it, and repeat it. So you hear it in your sleep. This is what Jesus came to fulfill. All right, 67 of Luke 1. And his father, that is John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit. He wasn't just glibly speaking some Jewish hopefuls. He was speaking the very mind of God. And look what he said. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Exclusive? Oh, I reckon. This isn't including the world. This is Israel. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He hath visited and redeemed His people. Now, ever since Genesis chapter 12 and the giving of the Abrahamic covenant, who were God's people? Israel. See, you know that. Israel. They're still the ones we're talking about. All right. Verse 69. And he hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. How many Gentiles in the house of David? Not one. Now, granted, a few of the women came in by marriage. I'm not denying that. But Largely speaking, the house of Israel was Jew only. And so for us in the house of David, verse 70, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been since the ages began, that we, now keep the pronoun, who are we talking about? Israel, the nation, that we should be saved from our, not sins yet, but what? Enemies. Goodness gracious, who were Israel's enemies at the time of Christ's first advent? Well, the same ones tonight. No difference. Egypt, Syria, the Persians, the Babylonians, the Greeks in general, the Gentiles, all around them. That's what they're enemies. All right? So they're going to be saved from their enemies. And all those that hate us. How many is that? The rest of the world. See, ever since World War II, we like to sort of stick our head in the sand and think that anti-Semitism is a thing of the past. Don't you believe it? Anti-Semitism is raising its ugly head more and more every day. See? Now, we all know why does the Arab world hate America? And they do. They hate us. Not because of our prosperity, although that's certainly a part. The liberals would like to make us think that that's the problem. You know, we've got so much and they've got so little. No. 
The root problem is that they feel that we love and are going to do everything we can to support the little nation of Israel. And I think uh, Osama bin Laden as much as said that. If America will quit supporting Israel, then he can back off too. So that's basically what's behind everything, is the hate for the nation of Israel. All right, read on. Verse 72, that when this king would come, he would perform the mercy promised to our fathers, same fathers that Paul referred to in Romans, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the prophets, and so forth, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Next verse, the covenant or the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. Boy, it's been a long time since we've rehearsed the Abrahamic covenant on this program. Most of you hear it all the time in our Oklahoma classes, but for those of you out in television, the Abrahamic covenant began back in Genesis chapter 12, where God made three basic tenets to that covenant. Maybe I should put it on the board once again. I haven't used the board in a long time. Maybe it's about time. That Abrahamic covenant comprised of first the promise of a geographical area of land. Secondly, within that land he would place a nation of people, the favored nation, the nation of Israel. The third part of that covenant was that in order to control the nation living within the borders of a geographic area of land, he would have to establish a government, and this government is going to be in the person of a king, and this king is going to be the Son of God, the Redeemer, the Messiah, and that was all promised to Israel. Now those are just sort of the generalities. Now you see you have to kind of come through Scripture to pick this all up, because even though this is promised back there in Genesis 15, 16, and 17, Yet we do not have the revelation of who this king is going to be until we get clear up to Samuel. And into Sa through the prophet Samuel and Nathan, God reveals that it's going to be through the house of David, the bloodline of King David and Solomon and Nathan. And through that genealogy then, of course, came Jesus of Nazareth. All right, that was all part and parcel of that Abrahamic covenant. All right, back to Luke. Verse 74, that he would grant unto us that we be de being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, peace, prosperity, no fear, and that we might serve him without fear. See, that's what Israel is still looking for. Oh, maybe not so much on the spiritual level, but oh, how they're longing for peace when they can go to bed at night and not have to worry about having to make a dive for a bomb shelter. You know, I read some time ago, do you realize that up there in northern Israel, just below the Lebanese border, there are generations of young people who from babyhood on up never slept in their regular bed. They slept in beds in bomb shelters in order to be protected from the constant bombarding from the uh, Hezbollah and so forth. But oh, how Israel is longing for peace, see? And they're just about getting ready to sell their soul to get it. Well, it does get kind of provoking when you can't walk down the street without fear of being blown to smithereens. It does get frustrating when you can't drive down the highway without wondering, well, am I next? Uh, I was just talking to someone on the phone the other day that way back in the 80s, he and his brother had flown over to Israel, just the two of them, and rented a car and spent a whole month just driving up and down the roads of Israel. I told Iris, you know, that'd be the way to go. But you couldn't do that today. My land, you know, you'd, you'd be in constant fear. But this is what Israel is longing for, see, all right? <coughs> that he would grant unto us, delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. Now here comes the spiritual element. In holiness and righteousness before him, all the days of our life. That was the hope of Israel based on the covenant promises. All right, now let's come back to Matthew once again. And so after being commanded to have nothing to do with Gentiles, 
we go through Christ's earthly ministry and you have the Sermon on the Mount and, and all these high moral statements, which of course are certainly profitable. I don't tell people not to read the Gospels for goodness sakes. All I maintain is that there's no doctrines of grace in these four Gospels. This is still under the law. But there's still a lot to learn, just like we're finding out in the book of Hebrews. All right, now I'm going to bring you all the way up to chapter 16, which is the end of Christ's earthly ministry. And even though they're as yet up in northern Israel, up there at the headwaters of the Jordan River, Caesarea Philippi, yet they're soon going to be making their way south and up to Jerusalem for the Passover and the crucifixion. All right, now look what Jesus is doing. Verse 13 of Matthew 16. Now this is all part of this gospel of the kingdom from which the readers of Paul's epistle were to move on. They were to leave it and move on to better things. Verse 13 of Matthew 16. Some of you have heard me teach this over and over. And so when Jesus came to the borders of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? In other words, what's he asking them? What does the rank and file Jew, amongst whom we have been performing miracles, we've been feeding the multitudes, we've been healing the sick, what do most of those people think who I am? And here's their answer. Look at this. I mean, this is shocking. This was the answer. Well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some think you're Elijah. Others, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. Imagine, after three years of trying to prove to the Jewish nation that he was the fulfillment of all those Old Testament promises. He was the Messiah. He was the Son of God. And they think anything but. All right, but now let's move on. Verse 15. But he saith unto them. Now remember this, the whole twelve. Judas is included yet. He saith unto them, But whom do you say that I am? Verse 16, and Peter, of course, is always the spokesman, and so he speaks up. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. What's the other word for Christ? Messiah. You know, I had a letter the other day. Somebody was bemoaning the fact that so much of Christendom uses Jesus Christ as a first and last name. Well, I hope you all know better than that. Christ isn't his last name. It's his title. And that's why once in a while you'll hear me slip in Jesus the Christ, which is really the most accurate. Because that's what he was. He was Jesus the Messiah. Or if you want to reverse it, Messiah, Jesus. All right, so now then this is what he is saying. Whom do you say that I am? And he says, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Did Peter have it straight? Yeah. Yeah, he did. And now look what Jesus said. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. Now we're going to cover this same concept a little later in Hebrews chapter 6. Even these disciples, fixing their nets on the shores of Galilee, and Jesus came by, now, a lot of you know the Gospels better than I do. What did Jesus say to them? What did he say? Come, follow me. Did they ask a ton of questions? Well, they say, who are you? What are you up to? What's your agenda? What's in it for me? What did they do? They dropped their nets and they followed. Why? Because the moment Jesus spoke, God opened up the understanding of these men. There's the one we're looking for. There's the one who is fulfilling all the Old Testament promises. And without question, they followed, see? 
and they knew that he was the Christ. And Jesus makes it so plain on what basis did they know? God revealed it. You know, I'm always using the verse in Acts, and I'm always saying, Lord, give me Lydia's. Why? Because when Paul and Silas, I think it was, had finished presenting the gospel to those Jewish women there at Philippi, the next verse says that the Lord opened the heart of Lydia so that she what? She understood the things that were spoken. Listen, that's never different. There's not a one of you sitting in this room that can get one ounce of sense out of this book without the Lord opening your understanding. There is not a person on this earth who has ever experienced salvation but that God didn't open first their heart. Now, I'm not a five-point Calvinist. Don't get me wrong. Nor am I a ten-point Arminian or whatever they call them. <laughs> but uh, I, I keep the thing to the minute. But yes, God does have to initiate. God does have to open the understanding. And then the individual has to make his choice. That's the way I look at it. But whatever, Peter says, you're the Christ. And Jesus said, blessed Peter, this is all I wanted to know. Now, you know what I call this? Peter's profession of faith. But what does Peter not mention? Death, burial, and resurrection. Peter doesn't say, well, now I understand that you're going to go to that cross and die for my sins. You're going to be raised from the dead. That's what I believe. No, no. Peter had no idea that Christ was going to go to a cross. Now, to prove that point, we go to Luke 18. Luke 18. We've used it on the program before, but like I said, we've got a lot of new listeners every day, so hopefully for them this is all fresh. Luke 18. And again, in about the same time frame, they're on their way up to Jerusalem for the last Passover and the crucifixion. And Jesus and the twelve. Luke 18, verse 31, honey. Luke 18, verse 31. And here again, verses that I think that most of Christendom don't even know it's in their Bible, and if it does, they don't read it. And so he took unto him the twelve, and he said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. All things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Now, we've got to be careful. These things that Jesus is referring to were back there in the Old Testament, but they were in such veiled language that nobody really knew what they meant. And, of course, I'm referring primarily to Isaiah 53, and you all know those verses. He is led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb opened not his mouth, and so on and so forth. Well, None of the Jews in Israel understood that that was a reference to a coming crucifixion. But you see, Jesus knew. And so he says, everything that was written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Verse 32, for he'll be delivered unto the Gentiles, the Romans. He shall be mocked, spitefully entreated, and spit it on. They'll scourge him, beat him unmercifully, and put him to death. And the third day, he'll rise again. Did Jesus know the end from the beginning? Well, of course. I think I've said it before. Maybe even the He knew exactly which Roman soldier would wield the whip. He knew exactly where the soldier was at this particular moment in time who would drive the spike. He knew exactly what the high priest was going to do. There wasn't anything hidden from him. I think I pointed out in the last taping, when he was sweating those drops of blood there in the Garden of Gethsemane and the disciples were sleeping, what did Jesus know? All of this. He knew it was coming. That's why he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup be taken from me. He knew the suffering that was lying ahead, and he did here. But now look what the disciples' answer was. Verse 34, And they, the twelve, understood none. My highlight that word or underline it or do something. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them. Who hid it? 
God did. It wasn't time for them to know. Then why did Jesus say it? Don't ask me. I don't know. Except to prove to us, you see, that he knew and they didn't. And if you have an argument with that, you know what I always come back and tell people? Now listen, if you don't believe this, then tell me. Why weren't these believers, these followers of Jesus and his earthly ministry, why weren't they parked outside the tomb waiting for his resurrection? Were they? No. No, they'd long gone given up. They'd even mentioned at least they were going to go back to their fishing. But here they are, completely unaware that Christ was going to be going to the cross. Why? Because they were all hung up on his bringing in the kingdom. All right, now I think I've got one more verse we've got time for. Come all the way into Acts chapter 1, lest you think that this whole idea of an earthly kingdom was a figment of my imagination or someone else's. No, this was on the apostles' mind constantly. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Now this is after his resurrection. And he's been with the eleven. Judas, of course, is gone. <clears throat> he's been with the eleven now, forty days. And he's ready to go ascend back to glory. And he tells them to wait ten days, of course, till the Holy Spirit would come on the day of Pentecost. But look what's on the mind of these eleven men. That's what I want you to see. After three years of that earthly ministry, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, the good news to Israel that the king and the kingdom were ready to be presented. Verse 6, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom again to Israel? What's on their mind? The kingdom. When Israel could live at peace and prosperity, and I haven't got time in this program, but you remember back in Matthew 19, Peter said, well, now we left all. We left our fishing nets. We left our families to follow you. What are we going to have there for? And what was Jesus' answer? You twelve. That's why Peter was in such a hurry to fill Judas' slot. He says, you twelve are going to sit on twelve thrones, ruling the twelve tribes of the nation of Israel. Pie in the sky? Fictitious words? No. That's exactly what was ahead of them, and it still is. And so the kingdom is still coming. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.